Let's have a word of prayer before we open up God's word this morning. Y'all join me in a word of prayer. Father, I thank you so much for my brothers and sisters here this morning who have put aside everything else to come and gather to worship you through song and praise, to worship you through prayer, to worship you through your word. Father, now is our time to hear your word. Would you please speak through me? Would you just please empower me to preach your word with authority, with enthusiasm? Most importantly, Father, that your truth penetrates all our hearts, first and foremost, my own. May you be the one to be seen, heard, exalted through your mighty word this morning, and may we be ready to be doers of your word, to see you glorified, and to further your kingdom through the world around us. We ask all this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Pastor John Piper tells a story about Carl Lundquist, who was the president of Bethel Seminary in college many years ago. And President Lundquist recalled one time how he came to recognize the importance of fasting and prayer as a spiritual discipline. He said it started when he met the Korean pastor, Dr. Jun Gong Kim. When he met Dr. Kim, he asked him if it was true that he had fasted for 40 days before the evangelism crusade in Korea in 1980. Dr. Kim said that was true. He was the chairman of the crusade at the time. They expected one million people gathering in the plaza in Korea for this evangelism crusade. But shortly before the crusade was to begin, the authorities told him they could not have the meeting. Korea was under martial law. There was much political unrest at the time. They were fearful that a big crowd might bring a riot, might bring much problem. So Dr. Kim and some of his associates went straight to a prayer mountain. They spent the next 40 days fasting. When they finished their time of fasting, they came down the mountain. They went straight to the police station. And on their way there, one of the police officers saw him. And he said, oh, we've changed our mind. You can now have your meeting. Well, Dr. Lundquist, president of Bethel Seminary, later wrote, Perhaps I have never desired a work of God with the same intensity. His body, Dr. Kim's, is marked by many 40-day fasts during his long spiritual leadership in Asia. Also, however, I haven't seen the miracles that Dr. Kim has. Hey, I'm ashamed to confess that I, too, haven't seen the miracles that Dr. Kim probably has. And I'm sure that most every American Christian would probably have to confess that we haven't seen the same miracles as he did. You know, last week we looked at Isaiah 58 and we talked about what God does through fasting. And we saw five things that God does through fasting, five actions that he takes through fasting. Well, I have four more to share with you this morning as we continue in Isaiah 58. So if you would go ahead and open it with me in your Bibles to Isaiah 58. Isaiah 58, as you're turning and finding... You know, I realized Friday I called for a one-day fast. And by the way, let me give a testimony to the Lord. Man, we had this middle pews all probably packed. Man, it was packed. We had some pastors from our association here Friday night, folks. We saw the Spirit move. Man, people were weeping. There were people gathering together. I was at this altar at one time. I felt a church member come and just pray with tears over me. Father, we saw the Spirit move Friday. He may say, well, pastor, the, the fasting's over. Why, why do we still need to talk about fasting? Well... Remember first, Jesus said not if you fast as his disciple, but what? When you fast. This is a continued discipline we should also implement. Also, you recall in Matthew 9, you know, the Pharisees were trying to trick Jesus, and they say, well, John's disciples fast, but your disciples don't. Remember what Jesus said? He said the time's going to come when the, the bridegroom's going to be taken away from them, and then they'll fast. Well, was the bridegroom been taken away? I mean, is Jesus walking in the flesh and blood on the earth right now? No, he was ascended. He's been taken away. We have the Holy Spirit. So he requires all of his disciples, that's you and me, if we call ourselves disciples, to continue to fast. And I told you last week that in Isaiah 58, man, God's people were doing all the right things. They were doing all the religious activities. They were fasting. They were going to the temple. But God sends his prophet Isaiah to call out the sins of his people. And he tells them, look, man, your hearts are far from me. You've got wickedness, you've got strife, you've got bitterness, you've got sin that needs to be dealt with. But then he goes on to start telling them, hey, 
when your hearts are right and you're fasting with the right motive, he begins to tell them all the great things that he does through a fast. And last week we saw, man, five things that the Lord does through fasting. Well, what I want to do this morning, I want to read Isaiah 58. I want to pick up in verse 6 this morning. We'll read Isaiah 58, verses 6 through 12. We'll do a very quick review of the five actions that we saw the Lord take last week through fasting. And then once we've caught up and we're, we've caught up with all that, then we'll continue on and we're going to see four more actions that the Lord takes and does when we fast with the right motive and the right heart. All right? Y'all with me this morning? Shake your hands, yes? All right, let's go. Isaiah 58, let's be in verse 6 now. New American Standard. Is this not the fast which I choose to loosen the bonds of wickedness, to undo the bands of the yoke, and to let the oppressed go free and break every yoke? Is it not to divide your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into the house when you see the naked to cover him and not to hide yourself from your own flesh? Then your light will break out like the dawn and your recovery will speedily spring forth and your righteousness will go before you. The glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call and the Lord will answer. You will cry and he will say, here I am. If you remove the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger and speaking wickedness. Verse 10. And if you give yourself to the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then your light will rise in darkness and your gloom will become like midday. And the Lord will continually guide you and satisfy your desire in scorched places and give strength to your bones. And you will be like a watered garden and like a spring of water whose waters do not fail, those from among you will rebuild the ancient ruins. You will raise up the old, age-old foundations, and you will be called the repair of the breach, the restorer of the streets in which to dwell. All right, now I said last week in the past few weeks that, that fasting, it's basically to, to put aside food or some sort of pleasure to set our hearts and our minds on the Lord. In other words, whatever it is that's hindering our, our close walk with him, whatever's getting in the way, to put it aside, seeking him. Now, I've talked about what fasting is. Well, why do we fast? Well, it's been said we fast because the emptiness makes us feel the need for fullness in God. The emptiness makes us feel the need for fullness in God. In other words, we want to say, Lord, I want you more than I even want food. The, the very necessity to survive and, and, and satisfy my stomach I'm willing to put that aside and want you more, hunger and thirst for you more. You see, fasting humbles us before the Lord. And what a great picture and reminder of the gospel. Humbling ourselves before Almighty God, admitting we are sinners in His presence, His perfect, holy presence. And He sent His Son, Jesus, to remedy that sin, to go on that cross and die for us and rise from the dead, rise from the grave, that's the gospel, my friends. And all we must do is humble ourselves, confessing and putting our faith and trust in Christ. In Christ alone, we are saved. And there's power in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And as we humble ourselves in fasting, folks, God promises in his word, we humble ourselves with the right heart, right motive. Man, he's got many great promises that he does through fasting. Now, last week we saw five actions the Lord takes through fasting. Let me catch this up real quick. We'll move on. I'm going to share four more with you this morning before we're through. All right? All right, let's look in God's Word. First and foremost, through fasting, we saw last week, number one, that with the right motive, God, through fasting, number one, He sets us free. Man, through fasting, we saw the Lord says He sets us free. Where do I get that? Well, look in verse 6. Is this not the fast which I choose to loosen the bonds of wickedness, to undo the bands of the yoke. In other words, he brings us freedom. I said last week, a, a yoke, many of you know, it was a, a, a metal, a, a wood beam that held uh, oxen and donkeys, and they would haul really heavy loads behind them. And that's the image he uses here. For you and I, today, in this day and age, when he gives us freedom, folks, he promises those same old sins that you and I keep confessing again and again. Lord, I'm sorry, please forgive me. Lord, I'm sorry, please forgive me. Hey, when we fast with the right motive and heart, he promises us to set us free 
He kills a spider like the illustration I gave last week. He sets us free, number one. All right, number two, though, we also saw last week that through fasting, the Lord smashes the strongholds. And he smashes the strongholds. In other words, he lifts us from oppression. Verse 6 again. Now notice, he asks that rhetorical question. Is this not the fast which I choose? And then look in verse 6. The second part of verse 6 in your Bible is here. And to let the oppressed go free and what? Break every yoke. To break every yoke. Again, there's that image of the yoke. He says he breaks it. He smashes that stronghold. The strongholds that many of us still carry with us, folks, we've been carrying for years. The bitterness, the anger, the unforgiveness, the racism, and the addictions, the grudges. Man, he smashes every stronghold through fast with the right motive and a pure heart, all right? All right, but third, we also saw another action he takes through fasting. We also saw number three, he shows us how to share. Man, he shows us how to share. Verse seven, look what it says there. He says, is it not to divide your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into the house when you see the naked to cover him and not to hide yourself from your own flesh? Now, I told you last week that hunger was a basic problem even in Jewish society at that time. I mean, the Jewish people had no problem looking after their families, their loved ones, but the poor, the homeless, the hungry, uh, they, they turned a blind eye. And God's saying, look, you're selfish. Your eyes are on yourselves. You fast with the right motive. I will put your eyes off of yourself and onto others. And folks, you and I aren't so innocent. I mean, this world is just, Jeff made reference to a moment ago, we're so good about, man, building ourselves these great big buildings and lots of things for ourselves and making sure our budgets take care of ourselves. But, hey, folks, God calls you and I to care for the poor and the hungry and the helpless just in the same way as he called his people back then. You know, I, I've known church bodies before that, man, God gave them these great facilities and they'd have people from the community that want to use them. And there'd be people that say, uh, oh, this is for us. We're not going to let you use this. Now, don't get me wrong, folks. We need to, to make sure that if we let somebody use our facility that they believe what we believe. They don't stand on unbiblical grounds or, 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 or just some uh, uh, immoral uh, stands. But at the same time, folks, God has blessed us and he's called us to share. And when we fast... Man, we get our eyes off ourselves and we look at others. He shows us how to share. Number three. All right, number four, though, we also saw that through fasting, man, God also, he shines our light, doesn't he? Man, through fasting, we saw, number four, that he shines our light. Where do I get that? Well, verse eight, the very beginning of verse eight, he says, then your light will break out like the dawn, all right? Now go down to verse 10. Notice the second half of verse 10 there. Then your light will rise in darkness and your gloom will become like midday. Hey, he promises to shine our light. And folks, in these dark days, in, in this, this ungodliness we see continue to, to get darker and darker and grow more and more, how much more does God need his people to shine the light? You know, and I'm ashamed to say that some of the gloomiest most sour people I've seen sometimes in the world are the churchgoers. Folks, it shouldn't be that way. Man, we should be the people with the light. Man, with the joy. Sure, we got our bad days. Sure, we got our suffering. Sure, we got our trials, folks. But we got something, folks, that nobody else does. It's Jesus. It's the eternal inheritance that's waiting for you and I. How much more should you and I shine our light? And when we fast, folks, I'll give personal testimony to you. Man, he shines our light through us. When we humble ourselves hungrier for him than we are even for food or some sort of pleasure, he shines our light. All right, but fifth and finally we saw last week, last week we saw number five, through fasting, he surrounds us with protection. He surrounds us with protection. Where do I get that? Well, look in verse eight, the second part of verse eight now. When he says, and your righteousness will go before you. The glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Man, the glory of the Lord. It's reminiscent of, of the Israelites in the wilderness. God's glory before them, behind them. In other words, he had their back. I've been talking a lot about that. And folks, he gives us protection when we fast. Now you may say, well, 
Preacher, what do I need protection from? Well, we talked about this Friday night. We prayed about this. Kevin Crosby touched on this. I led us through some praying, folks. When you and I fast and pray, we can expect two things to happen. I shared this with you last week. First, you and I can expect, folks, that we will enter spiritual warfare like never before. You can guarantee, folks, when you start fasting, humbling yourself with the right heart, with the right motive, you better believe, you better be ready. The devil's coming. Folks, I've seen it again and again. I remember one time, I was coming back from vacation, and as I was driving back, and when, when a preacher goes on vacation, he usually has, has a message ready to go when he comes back, so he, so he has that, 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 that time ready to go to, to bring that sermon out. And the, We were traveling back, the Lord just laid a, a new message on my heart. So I got back that Friday, and I started putting this message together, and, and the Lord was just leading my heart just to start a fast, and it was a time when I was just really serious about, Lord, I, I want to just, every single sin in my life, Lord, you just, just take it, Lord, just cleanse me, just, 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 I want to just be so purified and set on you. It was that Sunday to preach the sermon, and I was in a fast, I felt the Spirit, man, I felt the Spirit moving, I was just empowered. I get up to, in the pulpit like I normally do, and I said a prayer, and as I'm just about ready to, to preach, I got a, a church member who stands up and says, Hey, preach on just a second. Everybody look around and see if there's a Bible sitting anywhere, anywhere around here. Folks, I know without a doubt that was the devil moving, folks, because I'll be frank with you that that individual, I'm convinced, had a demon in him. You may say I'm kind of crazy, folks, but I know. Man, I'm telling you, spiritual warfare, it happens. When you get serious, you start seeking God, and you're serious about it, folks, be ready. But here's the encouragement here. We can also expect God's protection. I mean, we can expect with all confidence that we are protected by God. He says it there in his word. He gives you and I the full confidence of his protection when we fast, all right? All right, so now we're caught up. Those of you who weren't here, you, now you have all, all five. But those of you who were last year, we've refreshed, we reviewed. Now we're ready to move on. I've got four more to share this morning of what God does through fasting, all right? Number six, through fasting, with a pure heart, God promises us he will solve the problem. Through fasting, number six, God solves the problem. Hey, what's that problem you're praying about? What is it that you're seeking God to answer in your life? Hey, he solves the problem. Look in verse nine. Then you will call, and the Lord will answer. You will cry, and he will say, here I am. Notice right there, he says, hey, he says, you fast. Hey, you will call, I will answer. Man, you, you cry out to me, here I am, he'll say. But, there's a but here, because a condition isn't there. You know, you look in the Bible, you'll notice in answer prayers, folks, there's almost every single time a condition, of, a condition for God to answer our prayer. And he tells his people there, if you remove the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger and speaking wickedness. And he promises to answer. But there's a condition. And again and again, folks, you study the Bible and answer prayer. You see Peter says, you know, hey, husbands, hey, make sure things are right with your wife. You're not going to be heard in your prayers. Hey, he says in the Bible, hey, you shut your ears to the, to, to the cry of the poor. I'm going to shut my ear to your cry. Hey, you've got unforgiveness in your heart that I've deal with. Hey, I'm not going to answer your prayer until you make things right. There's a condition, folks. And folks, unfortunately, man, there's so much pointing of the finger and wickedness, folks. Sometimes it's the worst places to find in God's own house and his own people. I had a deacon, one of the churches I served a while back. He was on fire for the Lord, one of the most, man, enthusiastic, joyful Christians I know. He was at church every single Sunday. He had a wife who was kind of slow about coming into church, and she was hesitant about it. Well, she eventually came back to church and started going, and she started coming to some of the, the women's groups, and she told her husband later, man, when, when, when one of them is gone, they all just start talking bad about one another and just talking behind each other's backs. I know another deacon who had a, a wife who wasn't saved, and, and, and she, she, she came to church, and, and again, when she discovered that there were more people acting the same way as people in her own office, she said, well, I can just go, go to my office every day if I want to be around this. Folks, we got to come before God and say, Lord, forgive me for pointing the finger and speaking the wickedness, Father. And folks, when we come before God with a pure heart and pure motive, he promises to answer our prayer. He will answer our cry 
every time, but we must remove that wickedness. We must come before him saying, Lord, search my heart. Try my anxious thoughts, Lord. And he solves the problem every single time. But let me say this, folks. We must remember, folks, God's solution may not always be what we want. When God solves a problem, folks, many times it may not be what you and I want, but we can be assured it's always what we need. Always. I mean, when you and I humble ourselves before God, we may say, God, here's the problem, Lord. Show me, Lord, what's the solution? God may say, hey, Brian, you're the problem. The solution may be you moving out of the way. He may tell you and I, hey, the problem is you. You need to make things right. You need to, to search your heart. It's on you. Hey, but when we come before him in a fast, putting our mouths and the, and the sin away, he solves the problem. All right, moving on, though. Number seven, we see also the Lord promises through fasting with a pure heart. Number seven, he straightens the path. Through fasting, he straightens the path. What do I mean by that? Verse 11, look with me in verse 11. I mean, he gives direction. I mean, he, he guides us. He shows us where to go. Verse 11, he says, And the Lord will continually guide you and satisfy your desire in scorched places. Hey, the promise here was that the Lord would always go before his people. Man, he'd show them where to go. He'd give them direction by his counsel, by his word, by his spirit. He guided the Israelites in the wilderness. He promised to continue to guide his people, folks. And when we acknowledge God in a fast, folks, he always promises us he'll straighten the path. He'll show us where to go. He'll show us what direction to go. Hey, the Bible tells us in Proverbs 3, verse 6. Many of you know this verse. In all your ways, acknowledge him. And what? He'll make your paths straight. Anybody here like to go somewhere and you have no idea where you're going? No, you, you like to go somewhere you don't know where you're going? Jenna, you're, the, you're one of the few people. Not me. I need to know where I'm going. I need to have my GPS. I need to have my map. I need to make sure I know where I'm going when I'm getting in that car. How much more when we enter life, folks, you and I can't afford to enter life not knowing where we're going. Lord, which way to go? Lord, what do I do? Which way to turn, folks? And God tells us when we fast and seek him, man, he straightens our path. He shows us which way to go. You know, I was on a Christian website this past week looking for illustrations to go along with this, and I came across one website a person wrote in, and they said, I, I have struggled the last year and, and a half trying to hear God's voice concerning my future and where he wants me. I have sought his direction. I have submitted my desires completely to his will. The only problem is I feel I've had no response whatsoever. What would you suggest? Hey, if that person contacted me, i point him to Isaiah 58. Hey, when God promises you right there. You seek him in the fast. He'll straighten the path, folks. I can testify to it myself. I had it happen to me. I was struggling with my career. Lord, I don't know what to do. Heard my preacher talk about fasting. He said, if you're, you're desperate for an answer from God, if you're seeking God on a specific matter in your life, fasting will have power to your prayer life. I said, I got to fast. I fasted. Guess what? God straightened the path. Show me where to go. He straightens our path, folks. We seek him in a fast, setting our minds and heart on him. Hey, you may recall in, in Acts chapter 13, Saul, who becomes Paul, he and Barnabas set sail on their first missionary journey, remember? And you remember what the church leaders did before they, they, they let him depart? They fasted over them. Let me show you. Acts 13, verses 2 to 3. While they were ministering to the Lord and, see right there? Fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Verse 3. Then when they had, there it is again, when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. Well, how did Saul, Barnabas, know where to go? I mean, how did they know what direction to go? Well, let me show you the next verse, verse 4. Acts 13, verse 4. So, being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. Hey, they were sent out by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit showed them where to go. But it all started, what? When the leaders fasted over them. They fasted over them, and the Lord straightened their path. He showed them where to go. Folks, I'm telling you, you're looking for the answer. Lord, I don't know what to do. Which way? Hey, may I make a suggestion? How about fasting? Charles 
Francis Chan, pastor in California, tells a story. He had a, his teenage daughter was debating whether to go on a mission trip. And he was fretting and he was worried about, man, I hope she makes the right decision. Oh, man, I hope she knows what she's doing. And, and she finally made the decision to go. And he, and he was getting ready to, to ask her, uh, do, you, do you really know what you're doing? And she said, hey, Dad, I've been, I fasted all week about this. He said, I got nothing to worry about. Hey, parents, let me make a suggestion. Grandparents, hey, start teaching your children and grandchildren to start fasting over issues in life. You know, one of the problems I see in America today is people rush into marriages. You know, somebody who's, who has the eyes, oh, I love you. And they hastily get into a marriage and there's a divorce. Man, we need to start teaching our children and grandchildren to seek God. God, is this a person I really should be taking that step towards? And young people, let me tell you something. I'm gonna, you'll, hear this, you'll hear me say this again and again throughout the years. My preacher that I was under for many years, I never heard him yell, except one time, and this is what he yelled about. He said, if you're single, never, ever, ever marry a non-believer. Amen. Never, ever, ever marry a non-believer. And folks, when you seek God, is this the person I should be dating? Lord, should I be going down this path? You show me, Lord. He'll light our path. He'll show us where to go, and he will stop us from getting caught up in that mess. Because, folks, I'll even share with you in my own family. I got family members, siblings who are married to non-believers, folks, and it's a mess. I still believe I'm still going to pray that God's going to save their soul, save those individual souls, folks. But it's a lot harder road than starting off with the right foundation and the right base. All right, let me move on now. All right, so through fasting, number eight, we also see God promises to strengthen the body and soothe the soul. Man, through fasting, he promises to strengthen the body and soothe the soul. Look in verse 11. Second half, verse 11. He says, and give strength to your bones, and you'll be like a watered garden, and like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. Man, he gives healing for the body. He gives strength for the body, soothing the soul. One of my favorite images in the Bible is that phrase, like a watered garden. You find that in Jeremiah. Think about a watered garden for a moment. Any of you who, water, who garden? I mean, think about your garden with the, the vegetables and the fruit and the produce. And you've had the sprinkler, you've taken the hose, and that water is on that garden, refreshing it, revitalizing it, renewing it, growing it, getting it stronger. Oh, what a great image, folks. And when we fast, God shows us, folks, he strengthens the body, he soothes the soul. All the junk that we eat today, and I'm just as guilty as the next person, the fried foods, man, the cholesterol, the caffeine, all of it, folks. But fasting, man, it gives us this healing element, strengthening the body, soothing the soul. All right. Ninth but last, here's the final action we see the Lord take through fasting. Number nine, for finally, through fasting, he starts the rebuilding. God's word shows us, folks, that through fasting, he starts the rebuilding. Verse 12, look with, with me. Those from among you will rebuild the ancient ruins, you will raise up the age-old foundations, and you'll be called the repair of the breach, the restorer of the streets in which to dwell. He brings revival, he brings revitalization, he brings restoration, folks. And the cities of Israel and Judea, I mean, they had been laid waste by the Chaldeans and the Assyrians throughout the history. You see again and again in the Bible, man, God's cities and those temples being torn down and God's people having to rebuild them. And folks, there's still rebuilding needed even today in our cities, in our churches, hey, even in our own city, Darlington. Man, we need a revitalization process. We need a rebuilding badly. And God promises to start the work when his people seek him in a fast. Hey, you remember Nehemiah? In my first sermon I preached here, I, I showed you Nehemiah. He heard that the, the walls were torn down in Jerusalem. Remember what he does when he first hears the news? I'll show you again. Nehemiah 1, verse 4. Nehemiah says, When I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days, and I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And he fasted. He knew there was a rebuilding that was needed. 
And his first course of action was to put everything aside and seek the Lord, and he fasted. Man, he promises to start the rebuilding, folks, when we fast. Hey, as I close this morning, I want to share with you a personal testimony, folks, of why I'm such a believer in fasting. Why I, I'm so passionate about this. A little over two years ago, it was December of 2013, I got word that one of my mentors in ministry, a man I dearly looked up to, a man who even did the baby dedication for my son, he attempted suicide due to a moral failure in his life. I felt like somebody had taken a fist and punched me in the gut. I mean, I was in a stoop. And I have to confess, folks, I'm not one who, who gets depressed, but there was just this one day I got to my office, man, and, and I was in a depression. And let me tell, tell you all something. If there's anybody here that suffers from depression, you've got somebody in your life who suffers from depression, that's nothing ever to be ashamed of. Even the greatest Christians, pastors, ministers, folks, hey, depression hits so many of us, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. Don't feel ashamed of that. It's rarely happened to me, but that day I was in the stoop. I couldn't work. I was staring at the wall. I couldn't concentrate, so I ended up just closing it up. I went home. I, I took a nap, and it refreshed me. And let me tell you, rest always is a good remedy. And I was still just in a stoop. I just couldn't concentrate those next few days. Well, I picked up a book that had been given to me a few months before. The book was titled The Power of Prayer and Fasting by Ronnie Floyd. And I began to read that book. And I began to incorporate fasting in my life as a regular spiritual discipline. And folks, I can stand before God this day and tell you that since that time, folks, I have been in a spiritual revival. I'm still revived and excited every single day about Jesus Christ and the gospel and who he is. Hey, sure, I have my bad days. And sure, there's some days I, I, I'm walking in the flesh. There's some days I can be a bear as a, as a husband, as a father, as a pastor. But let me tell you something. Since that day, since that time I've started bringing fasting in my life, folks, every single time all I got to do is look back at the cross and look back at the gospel and be reminded of who Jesus is, folks. And I get revitalized. I get renewed. I get rejoiced. I get excited. I get repassioned and rejuvenated again. And I'm convinced it has to do with fasting. And I want that for every single one of you. I want every single one of you to live the abundant life that Jesus has promised us, folks. And I'm here to tell you as a witness, as a testimony, I'm here to tell you my own life. Hey, when we start putting fasting in our own lives as best we can physically, skipping a meal, maybe if we can't do it and, and, have, and we got to have food, we got to put that pleasure away, I'm here to tell you. He'll strengthen the bones. He'll soothe the soul. He'll shine that light. Man, he'll light that path. He will bring that revitalization to you. Hey, would you all just close your, head, close your eyes and bow your heads for just a moment? And with all heads bowed and eyes closed. Hey, first and foremost, before we go any further, I mentioned a moment ago that we, we need to humble ourselves before the Lord, acknowledging that we are sinners. Hey, and before we even talk even more about fasting, before you even worry any more about what fasting can do and if you need to fast, first and foremost, you need to make sure you're right with the Lord. You need to make sure without a doubt that if you died today, that you'd be in paradise with Jesus. And if you're not sure that, without a doubt, that you can say that, let me tell you, all you got to do is to see God as holy and pure. He made us in his own image, but sin has separated us from God. Every one of us is full of sin. I am. Sin dooms us. It separates us. We have no hope with sin. He takes it so seriously, folks. The, the wages of sin is death, eternal death. But the good news is that God knew there was only one price that could be paid to pay for that sin. <coughs> and it was the blood of his one and only son. And he sent his son into this world to live a perfect, sinless life. He went on that cross. He shed his blood to pay that price. He rose again, conquering the grave, allowing anyone to put their faith and trust in Jesus and Jesus alone for salvation. If you've ever done that, I want to urge you, make that decision today. Hey, maybe there's others of you here this morning. Maybe, maybe you're just trying to struggle with a problem. Maybe you're trying to decide what path to take. Maybe you don't know what to do. 
Are you seeking God on a specific matter in your life? Are you desperate for an answer from God? Folks, I'm here to tell you in my own life, fasting will add power to your your prayer life. Man, fasting will break those strongholds. It will loosen those bonds. It will light our path. It will rejuvenate, rejuvenate us, revive us. And maybe you can't do a full fast. You must have food for a medical condition. You can still fast. You can put aside that TV for a day. You can put aside that golf game or that that hunting trip you have. Whatever that pleasure is, you may be able to just skip a meal or might, might skip a whole day putting that food aside, drinking juice, drinking water, and just saying, Lord, I want to see you. I want to be filled by you. Hey, folks, I'm convinced if God's people start fasting regularly, If all the churches in America had fasting Christians calling upon Him, seeking Him, Father, we would see the power of God to take this nation back and to see things change. But I'm here to tell you, folks, it starts by us humbling ourselves, making sure our hearts are right, making sure there's anything we need to confess and make right with Him. And He'll move when His people humble themselves. Would you do that this day? Maybe there's other decisions you need to make. We're getting ready to have an invitation time. It's our time to do business with God. As I In my prayer, would you come as we do business with God? Father, I thank you for your word, and I thank you for the reminder that you're for us. Man, you've got our back. You want to see us live that abundant life. You have great gifts for us. But you have a condition that we humble ourselves, that we put aside the strife, we put aside the the wicked words. Father, I pray that you would Convict us all to search our hearts and try our anxious thoughts, first and foremost, myself. And once we lay that aside, Father, would you just move? Help us to understand, folks, that that, that fasting is about wanting your will and your way, not to try to conform you to our ways or manipulate, manipulate you, but to grab a hold of you of where you're working, what your will is. Father, you be glorified through your people as we respond to you this day. We give you the glory in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Would you please stand as we have a